Welcome to the swamp, my friends. Today we are on episode 4 of the Strange and Scary Story series. Now as always, these are stories I wouldn't typically read on the channel. These aren't cryptid stories or paranormal really, they're just normal, everyday scary stories. If you have a story you would like to share, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, and stories like yours to help keep this channel going. Joining me today reading story number 2 is my friend Somber Reads. If you enjoy their voice, please be sure to check them out after the video is done. The link to their channel is in the description down below. Now, without any further hesitation, let's get into these creepy, strange, and honestly, downright scary stories. This happened five years ago, in the area I grew up in. Back then, I was up to no good, but I have since turned my life around. At the time, I was one of the very few people that moved large amounts of pain pills in the city. The rest of the people trying to move these pills had them imported from sketchy people from around the world, so you didn't always get what you paid for, and the strength would vary a lot. I managed to get a hold of real ones from within the country, and still in their original packaging. Word quickly got around. I wasn't very well liked since I guess I took business from people. This incident happened on a hot summer day, and I decided to go out to the park to relax. Where I lived, there was a main road with apartments on both sides. In front of my complex, there was a parking lot. To the right of the parking lot, was another set of apartments with trees separating that complex from another. I was walking in the wooded area between the two complexes as a shortcut to get to the park, so I'm just walking, minding my own business. When I start hearing what sounds like gunshots, they sounded really close, so I hid behind a huge tree. I didn't really know what was going on, but looking around I could see the foliage around me move with each gunshot. In retrospect, I guess it's pretty obvious, but hindsight is 2020 or whatever. Anyway, I waited for silence, and then I peeked behind the tree to see what was going on. I managed to get a quick peek of a guy holding a gun, leaning back into his apartment. Change of plans here. I ended up running back to my block as fast as I could, where I then slowed down. Pretty bummed at this point, I really wanted to go to the park. Anyway, at this point, I'm not sure where to go. Home might have been a good idea, but before I was able to give it much more thought, I saw two guys appear behind me. Feeling a bit uneasy, understandable perhaps, I keep my eyes on these guys and just keep walking. I act like I know where I'm going. It was weird, they didn't really talk to each other and they kind of split up on the walking path, still heading towards me. This is when I start to realize that something definitely isn't right here and I up my walking pace to test it out. That's when one of them reached for something in his pocket or waistline. I couldn't really tell because I just took off again. I still didn't know where, where I should go at all. But I ended up deciding to go to my childhood friend's apartment, which was on the other end of this area. Oh, and her apartment complex is a code, which she usually kept me up to date with since we hang out a lot. Back then, I'm not sure if it's still like this, but the code changed every few months or so. Anyway, I finally make it to her apartment and punch in the code. Wrong code. I try again. Wrong code again. So no I'm panicking because I can't see these guys anymore and I can't get into the stupid building. I called her phone and luckily she was home and buzzed me in. I ran up the stairs and explained the situation when I got inside. We played cards and just hung out till the evening. She offered to walk me home but I declined. I just felt it a bit unnecessary to put her at possible risk. I ended up getting home safely. A couple of weeks before this, two people had picked me up and tried to carry me into a car while I was on my way to pick up some food. I have a feeling that they are the same people, but I couldn't really see the shooter's faces very well, probably from some sort of adrenaline, so I guess I'll never really know.
Well, let's make this short and sweet. I am now a 31-year-old disabled army vet. At the time this happened, I had literally turned 21 the day I flew into Ketchikan, Alaska, and had just gotten out of the army a year prior. I was also in Afghanistan in 2006. So I get off of the plane and get ready to take the ferry over to the island. My girlfriend had taken it over to pick me up so she could drive me around the island. From the moment I stepped foot onto the main island, I knew that I was being watched. Not think I was. Full-blown being watched. I felt like I was in Afghanistan again. I was in full combat mode for the entire month. Anyway, she drives me around, and after a bit, the feeling goes away. Now my girlfriend's house was on the side of Deer Mountain, about three to three and a half stories off the ground. There were just as many stairs that led from the parking lot to where the house was she was staying. Her parents lived above in her house. She had the one underneath theirs and there was another one under her. Imagine a very beautiful Mexico City style setup. So we get to her house and hang out and chill for that day. So just to fast forward a bit, every night I felt something was staring at me. Anytime I went anywhere, I knew I was being watched. The only place I never felt it was when I climbed up Deer Mountain. A few weeks go by and I start getting interested in the Native American history a bit. She takes me to the Totem Pole Museum, introduces me to a lot of awesome folks who told me normal everyday stuff about the tribe she's from. That takes a week of our time just doing that. So the first day of my last week, I'm standing on the porch looking out, and I hear a blood-curdling scream followed by a little girl begging for help. It sounds like it is literally within meters of the bottom of the steps. I should mention, I've told my girlfriend many times about the feeling of being watched, and she just tells me not to think about it, and to try my best to forget about it. I run inside to grab my knife and tell her to call the cops. She jumps up and asks why. I tell her what's going on, and the blood drained from her face. I thought she was going to pass out. She grabs me and begs me not to go outside. She says to trust her, but if I go out, I'll be lost forever. She says that she'll explain later. At this point, we can hear the cries inside the house from three and a half stories up. The next day, she takes me to see some people, and they did a blessing on the property and told me that it was the Kushtaka or what they call Otter Man. Apparently, they were created by the raven to help those lost at sea come back. They mimic voices. I can't remember if they changed shape or not, but after a while, they became evil and started luring people to them and kidnapping them. Everything is fine, though, until you eat anything they offer you. Once you do that, you slowly start to transform into one. My last week was filled with learning lore and learning more about the creatures the tribe knew about. I felt I was being watched all the way up until when we got on the ferry to leave the island. That's my story. Thanks for sharing it. Back in 2004, I went on a trip with two of my best friends to Maine. One of my best friends is from there and wanted to visit his home as well as, you know, just see some nice sights. At the time, we were all living in Southern California, so we had taken a flight there and planned on driving back across the country at the end of our planned two weeks in Maine. The days of Maine came and went, 
a story for another time. And the three of us were getting ready for the final part of the trip. The three plus day road trip from Maine to Southern California. This story is about what happened on the second night of the road trip. We had been traveling in my friend's beat up old Volkswagen bus, a literal hippie van, non-stop at 60 miles per hour tops. Against all odds and warnings from mechanics who laughed when we told them we were driving to California in it, the old VW bus suffered a complete electrical blowout at 1am on a busy truck ridden freeway outside of Springfield, Missouri. I was driving the moment it happened. Smoke poured out of the radio, and the headlights turned twice as bright for about 30 seconds before fading and flickering to nothing, along with all the rest of the lights inside. The engine stopped and I had to pull over as far as I could so that the mass of trucks barreling down the freeway didn't clip us. The VW was completely dead and unresponsive. Great. Stranded in the middle of nowhere in the south at an ungodly hour. This was 2004, and our phones were old and service was bad out there, so my buddy elected to grab a skateboard and see if anyone or anything was nearby. Meanwhile, my other friend and I tried calling AAA for a tow truck to take us to a mechanic in town. We got a hold of a man who said he can get us and keep our hazards on. My brother, who skated away, came back at this point. He said he found an eerie looking junkyard but was too far and too afraid to approach it by himself, so he came back. We told him a tow truck was coming. As we waited, we could feel the fatigue of driving non-stop for two days settling in our eyes and bones. But we knew we couldn't sleep. We needed to wait for the tow truck and to get the hell off this freeway first. Finally, the tow truck arrived. At first it struck me as odd. I had a AAA send trucks out before and none of them ever looked remotely like this one pulling up to our broken blown down Hennevin. Finally, the tow truck arrived. At first it struck me as odd. I had AAA send trucks out before and none of them looked remotely like the one pulling up to our broken down hippie van. The other trucks were in uniform or in some sort of color scheme and had the recognizable logos and top of the line towing equipment. Really professional looking trucks. This truck was rusted brown all over, looked like a junker from the 60s with an old school tow swinging off the back crane. There were no AAA logos or colors anywhere. The three of us glanced at each other, all thinking the same thing, uh, sketchy but we were in a bad situation and had just called the tow company, so surely this must be their man, right? The driver was about in his 40s and greeted us through the passenger window. He sounded like a well-to-do guy and hopped out to start attaching the tow to our VW. He had a mullet and smoked a cigarette as he went about attaching the tow, asking us general questions like what happened, where are you from, where do you need to go, and so forth. We calmed down and accepted this guy as pretty normal, and is just working late. He says the nearest mechanic is about 40 minutes away and to hop in. Riding inside this tow, it looks as though it's being lived in and worked in. There is a faded AAA sticker in the window. The driver mainly talks about his life and hobbies the whole time. He listened to a particular satellite radio station about gun enthusiasts and pretty extreme and explicit content that he talked over. My friends and I exchanged glances and looked at each other in the darkness of the cab, not sure what the hell to think to ourselves. The truck rattled along the freeway, and then we were in the city, and finally he dropped us off with the bus and the mechanic. We thanked him, and he left quickly after that. While figuring out stuff with the mechanic, I got a phone call from the AAA towing service. Hi, this is AAA. We sent the truck to your location but didn't find you or a Volkswagen on the side of the highway. Do you still need assistance? I was confused. Your guy found us and took us into the city, I said. There was a, a pregnant pause. No, our guy was still out looking for you and reported back unsuccessfully finding you. You got picked up and towed though? Did you call someone else? I could feel my heart skip. No, we thought it was a AAA driver who got us, I said slowly. No, that wasn't us. If you didn't call someone else for a tow, then I don't know who picked you guys up.
My name is Morgan, and at the time of this story, I was 14 years old. I'm a girl who enjoys the nerdier side of life. This was my first experience playing Dungeons and Dragons with a few of my friends at a place called the Sci-Fi Factory. This is a public place, and to be honest, the place is worse for wear. There are holes in the plastic tables, gunk on the floor, bad outlets, and even worse people. The people here range from decent to flat out creepy. This is something I learned the hard way. As I was setting up my elf rogue character, a man came over to my group. Let's call him Robbie. He told us he was 24 and talked to my friends. They seemed to know each other, so I was more than okay with letting him join us. He was white, brown hair, busted glasses, and that made his eyes look bigger than they really are and nothing out of the ordinary clothes. He introduced himself and his age, and then asked the same of me. I told him I was Morgan, and I was 14. Robbie quickly showed his weirder side, even if it wasn't the conversation piece he'd complain about how stupid his girlfriend was, and tell her he came here just to avoid her. He didn't break up with the girl because she was his only source of income and shelter. He hated her. That was clear. He also bragged about the knife he stole from Walmart and even showed it to us. Hell, he let me hold it and taught me how to flip it in and out without hurting myself. Remember those glasses? Well, they were busted and broken up from a bar fight. That really unnerved me about this guy. He seemed so kind and friendly, but he was so casual about talking about assaulting people. Then, he did what I never expected him to do. He got my attention and made me lead towards him so I could see his android phone, still plugged into the water charge. He had a notes app open and it read, Hey, I know this sounds creepy, but oh god, this can't end well. I think we should totally date. There was a whole paragraph or more written, but I didn't need to see what he thought of me. That was just, I was already creeped out, honestly. He expected some sort of response, so I gave him one. Oh no, I'm not really interested in a relationship. Oh, that's cool, that's cool. Still friends? Yeah, sure. What was I supposed to say? Not to the guy that's been in a bar fight and has a knife on him. Neither of my friends heard our conversation, so I was stuck next to Robbie for the next hour until our session was over. During that time, I offered Robbie some gummy worms. They weren't my favorite thing in the world, but the Dollar Tree nearby has good prices. He laughed and said to me, Food is the way to the man's heart. Are you trying to seduce me right now? Um, no. You could say it's a joke and doesn't have any deeper meaning than that. But coming from a man 10 years older than me who had just asked me out, I wasn't really laughing at it. When I left the store after the session had ended, I told my friends what had happened. They believed me and told me he was kind of a weird guy. I have been back to that store and ran into him once again. He was with a group of friends and a girl I recognized. He kept on asking me to come on over and I insisted no. My friends who I was with already knew the story and I was admittedly nervous. Even as we were leaving he tried to get me to come over. But after that I have never seen him again. I later learned that it's because he was arrested for assault and vandalizing school property. Funny thing is, he doesn't even go to any school. In July of 2018, my family and I went to my aunt and uncle's house in Maryland. They go on vacation for a weekend, and they let us stay at their house. They live like 10 minutes away from Baltimore, so we usually go there for a day and go back to the house later. Everything was fine until the third night. When we got back to the house, my dad and brother went upstairs because they were tired. My mom and I went into my uncle's office to go on his computer to see what we could do the next day. We heard some strange noises. My mom just assumed they were house noises, but the noises seemed a bit heavy to be house noises. My mom went to the bathroom and I sat at the computer looking at attractions when I heard my uncle's dog growling from the living room. 
She only growls or barks when she sees someone she doesn't recognize, so I got a little scared. My mom came out of the bathroom, and I told her the dog is growling at something. She went to the living room to check on the dog, and everything seemed normal except for one thing. The lamp was on, but the thing about that was, is I remember seeing it unplugged entirely. The lamp is also in the corner behind the giant couch, and the cord has a switch on it to turn it on or off, but the switch was closer to the floor. It would take a lot of effort to plug it in and turn it on. She assumed it was me and turned it off, but I kept telling her I didn't turn it on at all. I decided to go to bed, which I kind of regret doing. I fell asleep pretty fast, but I woke up at 3 in the morning to a strange sound. I just kept hearing the squeaky mattress noise over and over again. I knew it wasn't my parents because I heard my dad snoring, and I knew my brother wasn't making that noise because I heard him snoring as well. All of our bedroom doors were open, so it was pretty easy to hear, but I was the only one hearing it. I started hearing the dog growling viciously from the living room. I was covered in my sweat, and my fear was rising. I then heard footsteps coming from the attic right above my room. I was wide awake at that point, and was going to wake up my parents but since I was so scared I didn't want to move. Eventually, all the noises stopped, but the dog was still viciously growling at something or even someone. She stopped growling after about 5 minutes. Everything was seemingly fine after that, but I had no interest in falling back asleep, and didn't get out of bed until I saw my brother get out of bed at sunrise. I asked him if he heard anything at all at 3 in the morning, but he said no. I also asked my parents if they heard anything, and they also said no. My mind was blown, and I thought I was going crazy. For the rest of the week, everything was fine, and that dog kept growling at something every once in a while. I kind of wish I got up out of bed to see what was squeaking, but I was also way too scared. I also wish I got up to see what the dog was growling at but no way in hell was I going to go up into that attic. I don't know if I was just hallucinating, witnessing paranormal activity, or what, but I definitely don't know, and it definitely was not a dream. To this day, I don't know who this strange man was. What exactly am I talking about? Let's go ahead and get started. It was around 2007, and I was staying over at my friend Abigail's house. She lived out in northern Oklahoma, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. She had left for the weekend on a business trip, and she was paying me $100 to take care of her pets. Since her house was two hours away from me, she told me I was more than welcome to stay at her house. I really didn't mind since she lived near a farm. As for the nearest town, it was at least 30 minutes away, with the nearest neighbors being 3 miles apart. So, on the first night I was there, I was with her German Shepherd, Roxy, on the couch and we were watching reruns of Cops. Around 2am, I had fallen asleep to the static on the TV. Suddenly, I was awoken by the sound of Roxy growling. Confused at what could have been taking place, I looked around for her, but had noticed she was nowhere in the living room. Her growling sounded like it was coming from a distance. I get up from my tired state and start stumbling around trying to find her. The growling then starts to get louder as I make my way over to the kitchen. There Roxy is, growling and scratching at the back door. It's one of those sliding glass doors. What I see on the other side was super creepy. There's a man. I want to describe in his late 40s, just staring into the room. I thought I was seeing things at first, until I started to notice them going for the doorknob. Uh, excuse me sir, but was there something I could help you with? He doesn't respond. Instead, he stops what he is doing and runs off into the dark. I wasn't sure if he had a weapon on him, so I don't even bother with chasing him. Instead. I go ahead and call the cops who showed up about 30 minutes later. I gave them a description, and they checked the surrounding farmlands. 
Sadly, they come up empty-handed. Since there was no signs of the stranger, there was nothing they could really do. That should have been the end of things, but they were about to get a whole lot worse. The next day goes by fairly normally. I wake up and take care of some chores at Abigail's house, and at around 5 p.m., I decided to take Roxy with me into town. Abigail had set up an appointment for her, and I was going to take her to get a bath. In the meantime, I would do some shopping. We returned home around 8 p.m., but noticed something was different. The most obvious was the front window was completely open. Now yes, it was pretty warm that summer, and I did leave the windows open, but one thing I knew for sure was that I had locked everything before leaving. Unless Abigail would come back home early, there would be no way someone would have been able to do that, right? In trying to figure this out, I had forgotten about the weird man from the other night. I leave Roxy in the back of the car, with windows down of course, and head over to check out the house. I head inside and nothing that… nothing seemed different. It was kind of eerie that it was just… everything looked the same, if that makes sense. You know. When you know there's something wrong, but you can't tell what. So blaming my forgetfulness, I bring Roxy inside and we settle down for dinner. At this point I had called Abigail and told her about what happened the other night. She goes on to say that she had a similar experience a year ago. She said someone had been following her and had tried to break into her house. However, he was never caught. Could it have been that this creeper had waited a whole year to make his move? I wasn't sure, but later on that evening, something took place. Around 2 a.m. I ended up waking up to use the restroom. Roxy was outside in her fancy doghouse which meant I was in there alone. While in the restroom, I began to hear movement in the guest bedroom. I opened the restroom door and start tiptoeing my way back to the room. I peeked through the opening of the door and what I saw was one of the creepiest sights of my life. Someone with a ski mask was holding an axe staring at the bed. I now watched as he began taking swings at it. My best guess was he thought I was in the bed, but the question was, where, where did he come from? I looked to the corner and noticed the closet was open. I started to connect everything. The window was open because he had snuck in. He then waited in the closet until I fell asleep. He must have fallen asleep too and not realized. That's when he snapped out from his sleep and decided to try to kill me. I'm just assuming at this point though. Anyways, scared for my life I ran out of the house as quietly as I could and called the police. While waiting, I watched from a distance as he walked into the field behind Abigail's house. I see the headlights of a minivan turn on, then he drives off, never to be seen again. Officers do a search of the area and they look more into it, but nothing ever came of it. I don't know who that man was, but something tells me he had planned for this for a long time. Oh. And by the way, Rachel was so frightened by the entire thing, she ended up moving in back with her uncle and aunt a few weeks later. In the meantime, she stayed over at a friend's house. As for the home, it has now fallen into disrepair and remains abandoned. The whole thing goes down as one of the most unexplained and scariest moments of my entire life. Thanks for listening to these creepy, strange stories. These stories are definitely not what I normally read, but I do hope you enjoyed them anyway. I get sent tons of stories like this and usually just throw them away, and I feel like that's such a waste. If you have a story that you would like to submit in a future video, be sure to send it in at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story. If you enjoyed these stories, please hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload them almost every single day, and all things natural and supernatural. If you're not aware, you can download your favorite scary stories from the swamp on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Podbean, and pretty much every other major podcast platform that you can find on the internet. Be sure to leave me reviews on there too, it helps me out a ton. 
If you made it to the very end, today's code word is backflipping tortoise. Comment that down below to let me know you made it to the end and to confuse anybody who didn't. I always enjoy seeing so many people partake in these code words. It brings me a lot of joy to know you guys care about these. Thank you guys, as always, and I'll see you guys soon. Tally ho.